understanding, as, as Melissa just shares with us, uh, the text for today. So important. Oh, well, you know what? I need to give you a microphone. Oh. We've got one right here for you. Good morning. Good morning. So we're reading from John 16, verses 5 through 11. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is, your, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and of, govern, and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tracy takes a burden off my shoulder right from the beginning. Well, having said that, why don't we grab a seat, and, and if some children like to go to junior church, feel free to do so. Oh. All right, all right. Child telling on their daddy. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. They've escaped. They've escaped. Well, it's good to have you here, folks. Uh, uh, once again, some people were on vacation, which is so good. You know, you need to take vacations, but you need to come back. But uh, the message today says, what fills you controls you. What fills you controls you, right? There's so many things that control our character and our behavior, right? We don't do things with a without a controlling force behind them. We really don't, right? Our actions or our inactions, they have a controlling force there. Nothing just happens. There's a force behind, behind everything that is done or said under the sun, as it says in Ecclesiastes. See, when someone bursts out in tears or they explode in anger, there's a force behind that. When you're with someone, they become quiet all of a sudden, right? Or they become moody. There's a reason for that. Something's going on in their lives, okay? What fills us controls us. You know, I'm not the master of my own destiny. There's some people that think they're so rich, I'm calling the shots. They're millionaires, they're billionaires, right? Because I'm calling the shots. They don't realize that that money is actually calling the shots and the things are calling the shots for them. I remember, I don't know if you're watching the superhero movies, but I remember this one scene, where one of the Batman movies or whatever it was, the Flash says to Batman, he goes to Batman, well, what's your superpower? And Batman says, I'm rich. It's a funny little line, it was there, but it's all, that's all Bruce Wayne was, he was rich. He had some really cool outfits, but, you know, that's all that he had when you think about it. That's all it is. But uh, we can make a list of things that fill us. We really can. And they control us. Anger can. Jealousy. Money. Hatred. Alcohol. Drugs. Politics. Even sports. All these things can control us. They really can. Here's my question for you this morning. Do you like what you're filled with? Do you like what you're filled with? Think of your life. What? fills your life? Are you filled with the Spirit? Is, or does that sound nebulous to you? Something that's out of, oh, filled with the Spirit, right? Okay. I'm just being honest, but I think in our text that Melissa just read to us, right, uh, that might be just how the disciples felt. They didn't have a clue, perhaps, who the helper was, right? And I think many well-meaning people today, right, they may say that they're born again, they may say they're Christians, they may say they have the Spirit in them, but they may not have a clue of what they're doing or that God's in. They're having a knowledge of God and having the nature of God are two different things. Yes, we can have the nature of God. We're to becoming more like God every day through a sanctification process. So things that fill us do not care whether someone is rich or poor, if you're educated or uneducated, whether you're male or female, young or old, the things that control us don't care about the shade of your skin, your ethnicity, okay, your country of origin, or whatever classification you want to make. The things that control us don't care. The things that, can, the things that fill us, if you will, sometimes think they're levelers in our life. They're levelers. What do I mean by that? Once you allow them in, they take up the space inside you, and they will immediately take you over, the things that fill you. They're in charge. 
They take control of the way you think, the way you speak, the way you act, the way you behave. Because what fills you controls you, doesn't it? It does. So today, I just have three points I'd like to go through today. Three points in this text in John uh, uh, 16, verses 5 to 11. The Savior and sorrow, because sorrow is a very important point in this text. The Spirit, the Spirit itself, and the Spirit's character. Three points I'd like to touch on today, and we shall touch on them after we stop and have a word of <gasps> prayer. Father, I thank you that we can be here, Lord. I am thank you that your word can go forward today from this pulpit. I am thank you for whoever hears this word, and that we will contemplate this point. What fills us consoles us. Father, I, I, please take control of the message, Lord. I wrote it down, but Father, I'd be much happier if you took control of it, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So what fills us controls us. And the first point is the Savior in sorrow that's in there, right? Because in our text it says, but I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Sorrow has filled their hearts, okay? No one asked Jesus where he's going, okay, at this point. Now, think about it. What's happening? They are traveling that night. They're traveling down Mount Zion across the Brook Kidron to the Garden of Gethsemane. So they're traveling. And they know where they're going at that point in time, right? Judas, knew, Judas is actually betraying Jesus at this moment, if you think about it, right? And Judas knows exactly where they're going. Judas knows they're going to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where they always went when they were in Jerusalem, right? That's where they went to, the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where they went. So important, but uh, where are you going? Where are you going? You know, the disciples had asked this question before, where are you going? They have. They've asked this question. Peter asked that question back in chapter 13 and verse 36. He said, Lord, where are you going? Okay. Jesus told Peter, where I'm going, you can't go now. But later on, you're going to go there. That's what he tells him. He did ask him where you're going. But uh, Peter protested. He said, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for your namesake. That sounds good. I mean, I got your back, right? That's what it sounds like. That's what it is. But uh, Peter's question actually was much more about himself, if you think about it. Why can't I go with you rather than, where are you going, Jesus, and why are you going there? Okay, that's what he should have been asking. He was, he was going, and Jesus' response to Peter really is actually revealing, and it's done in the form of a question. I want you to think about this. How does Jesus respond to Peter? Will you lay down my life? Will you lay down your life for my namesake? It's interesting. Do you really do that? Sometimes we need to hear things in question form, right? Jesus didn't say, you won't lay down your life for my namesake. No, he put the burden on Peter and said, think it through, Peter. Are you really going to lay down your life for my namesake? Do you really want to go where I'm going? I mean, there's so much more to this, but a question form is very important, huh? And think about how how defeated Peter was at that moment. He was feeling sorrow. He was feeling deflated. Honestly, wasn't he? Okay. Jesus said, no, you're going to deny me three times. He follows it up there. See, this is a huge reality check on Peter's motive about, Lord, where you're going. It's a, it, it's a reality check on this. It's the same today, today. It, it really is today. Knowing how great Jesus is and not knowing Jesus. Every religion says Jesus is a great man. Sounds good, all right? But if Jesus isn't who he says he is, okay, then Jesus is the worst. You ever think about that? He said he's equal with God. He said he is God, right? See, with Jesus, what I love about it, it's an all or none proposition. He is or he isn't. And it's not a leap of faith. It's never a leap of faith. A leap of faith indicates there's no evidence. We have the word of God, and it's loaded with evidence of who Jesus Christ is by numerous, numerous eyewitnesses. Another story, but uh, Jesus told them he was leaving, but their response carries no hint of an eternal perspective at all, only a, f a reflection of their present pain that they're experiencing, right? He's leaving, and we know what they're saying? I'm suffering loss. I'm suffering loss. And sorrow and grief of what the disciples are feeling, but sorrow and grief really is an inward focus. I'm not saying it's bad. But it is an inward focus uh, uh, of emotions. It really is. Case in point, if your boyfriend or your girlfriend leaves you, right, 
they fire you, they dump you. You get dumped by your girlfriend, right? Arr. You feel sorrow for yourself. You have grief. This happens, right? This happens. If someone you love dies, you become sorrowful and there's grief in your life. The grief is hard, isn't it? It enters into a person's life. You know, in that grieving process, it's very important that a person that's in grieving is in a loving environment. I really want to suggest this to us. No one should be grieving alone. There might be times when someone has to grieve alone for a period of time, but in general, you should not be alone. Isolation, isolation brings a person into depression. It brings a person into being self-absorbed and even self-destructive state of mind. Depression puts a person as a desert island. That's what it does. Feeling deserted is something we do not want to be filled with. And I tell you what, there's a pervasive feeling of desertedness in our society today. Do you agree with that? Is, amen. Is that true? Do you see this? Is it just me? Because I'm seeing people feeling deserted all the time. I'm saying, oh, my heart goes, oh, dude, what's up? You know, I meet with people. Because what fills you controls you. Fills you, controls you. In Proverbs 18, it says, For the spirit of man will sustain him in his sickness, but who can bear, uh, but who can bear a broken spirit? It's sort of like two different scenarios in this one little verse, right? It's a clinical fact. You know, if you are sick, if you have cancer or some disease, and you have a positive attitude, statistically you live longer. It's just a fact. So my sister uh, uh, passed away this year, my sister Marilyn, and uh, she started with cancer in 1987. 87, 87. And uh, my sister is what you would call a fighter. And if you knew my sister, you knew her spirit, she'd knock your block off. I mean, she, 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 was, a, she, was, a, she was a fighter just in sports. She was like a tigress. Okay, she's the one I was. Uh, this funny story. She'd be playing softball, and whether it was a walk or a hit down the first base, she'd run down the first base. But she, no one knew what happened. They think the play was over. She would turn first base and go to second and slide. They didn't know what hit her. She was just out there. She was a fighter. I just loved it when she'd do that in the game. They just didn't know what hit her. But at any rate, but she was a fighter because she had goals. She says she wanted to see her daughter graduate high school. Then she wanted to see her graduate college. Then she wanted to see her to get married. Then she wanted to see her grandchildren. She did this. She, her spirit allowed her to sustain her so long. I said, the spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, right? And this is true. But sometimes, when wounded, we may not be able to heal ourselves of the wound. Okay? There's a different kind of thing going on here, right? We need someone to come alongside of us, to pray for us, and to pray with us. And this is just what Jesus is bringing his disciples in this message. This is his bringing. Remember, he's talking, the helper's coming whoever that is. Huh? The disciples were wounded spirits. Please do not be of the mindset that, oh, those disciples, they walk with Jesus. They should have really been knowing what they're doing, right? We know the old thing. We appointed someone three looking back at you, okay? They should have been able to sustain themselves. No, they were hurting. That's what they were doing, right? That's what happened. You see, Jesus could see the world from the disciples' perspective, seeing their grief and their sorrow so important. See, he had empathy for them. The ability to see the true, to see truly of another person's perspective, all right? It's not always, a, keep empathy it doesn't mean you agree with it, but you can see where they're coming from. Sometimes empathy, you know, it can be described as your, your ability to get inside someone else's head, because you can see where they're coming from. Empathy is important. And I thought about this, right? And, I, you know, what I do when I do messages, I think about what I've done historically, and I get embarrassed sometimes. Just saying. So I've, I've done a lot of financial counseling with people over the years. Just have. Don't know why. I don't know, but I do it. And, uh, and it's a funny thing. I've learned. I've, I've progressed. Just so you know, I'm going to tell you this story, but I'm better, right? Okay? Smile at me. Let me know that you, you believe that I got better. But I would first meet with some people sometimes, and I look at their finances. Let me finish what I'm saying. I look at their finances, and I say, oh, my goodness, I would never do that. But I don't say it out loud. I say it in my head. I never said that to anyone. But my point being is, there's something about my thought process in there, wasn't it, right? I had to learn to see things from their perspective. I know they're in financial trouble. I get that, right? So we can jump to this conclusion. And, and, and that's a very, very dangerous thing to do, right? It really is. I need to mature my thinking, my ministry. You know why? Because that person matters more than the money. Money's a problem. But what about the person? What about their, right? What controls a person fills them? See, that person's even their financial debt 
might be them trying to fill their lives with things, right? That's what we're doing. Not realizing that the things are what are controlling them. So you just don't judge a person, right? Help them. It takes time to understand another person's point of view in this world. It really does. They have their life experiences. Everyone has a story, and everyone's story deserves respect. Everyone's story deserves to be heard. Is it ugly? That's okay. It needs to be heard. Empathy is not a validation of anything. But do I care enough to help those people to get from wherever they're at and bring them to a better place? Do I? Do I? Jesus knows the disciples' story, and he understands their sorrow. This sorrow was, here's what their sorrow was like. I was trying to think about it. This sorrow was like a little boy, and Dad's going to take him fishing Saturday. It's cool, but he's going to take him fishing. But Dad gets a call from work, an emergency call, and he's got to go to work. What's the little boy say? Oh, Dad, where are you going? Right? I mean, if you have children, you know, you've heard some similar things, right? Where are you going? Tell me, does the little boy really care where Dad's going? He's sorrowful and in grief because he's did get not getting to do what he wants to do. He's immature. He doesn't understand it. And I think this is where the disciples are at this point. They're immature in their walk. But they've been walking with Jesus. I get it. But the word of God is to be, they're walking with Jesus. They're still immature. That's where they're at. We need to realize this when we read the word of God, okay? They sort of self-absorb themselves. They're upset about their own loss of him leaving. They're like the little boys, spiritually immature. But now we come to the spirit. And it's called, in our text, it's called, some, depending on how you, what version, it's called the helper or, or the comforter. What, it doesn't make any difference. I don't care. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Okay. Okay. If Christ doesn't go away, the Holy Spirit's not going to come. All right? Here's the thing. What is the helper? What is the comforter? Okay? Remember this. This is how conversation is taking place, as we read it, between Jesus and the 11 disciples in the middle of the night, traveling from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane. Ain't no one else there, folks. There's no one else there. There just isn't. They're the ones, these disciples, they're the ones that need, they need to know who the helper is first, don't they? I mean, Christ is the foundation, and he's going to use them to build his church. They need to know who the helper is. Whatever the helper is, be in their position for a minute, okay? The disciples, understand this, the disciples, what are they? They were Jews, and they, they've worshipped one God, right? Jehovah, Yahweh, right? El Shaddai. Adonai, whatever names, the many names of God you can call, that's who they worship. Now comes along Jesus. See the scenario. Now comes along Jesus. And what John the Baptist says, behold, here's the Lamb of God. And Jesus calls them to follow. Very important, right? And they know about Jesus. Jesus maintained the law completely. That's what he did. Jesus was the author of the law. They're figuring this out, huh? Jesus spoke of the intent of the law not what humanity envisioned about the law. Because the law really dealt with the heart, and that's what's been missing all along. Here's my, to my way of thinking, a little side note. I think why Jesus came at this time is finally God said, enough is enough. I know he had his plan. Enough is enough. I've given you this way to worship, and you're just ignoring it and all these things. But at any rate, it's to deal with the heart. And we know in Jeremiah 17, 19, famous text, but i got to say it, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked who can know it. See, a person cannot know their own heart till their own heart is exposed to themselves. Light needs to be shed into our lives. We don't know our own hearts. That's what it is. And that's where the helper comes in. That's what we're going to get to. Because the disciples are now faced with Jesus, this person that they love, they've been following for three plus years, leaving. And some person, some entity, something called the helper coming to replace him. Once again, see this from their perspective. Not from, oh, I got the word of God. They don't know who the helper is. They know about the spirit to a certain extent. But remember, the spirit's going to come in a way that it never has before. 50 days after Jesus' uh, resurrection at Pentecost. That's what's there. But the replacement's coming. And when I say the replacement, this replacement is not like a new hire at work, right? All the resumes come in, you're going to hire someone new. 
we hired this woman. She's, you look at her resume. She's been MIT, Harvard, all the, all the, she's great, and she's so qualified. She shows up on the first day, right? Can she do everything? No. You know why? Because first, she's, she needs to know where a desk is. <laughs> she needs to know where the bathroom is and different things. Some basic things you need to learn. But see, the Holy Spirit's coming as a replacement. Doesn't need to learn anything. It's just there. It's going to come and take care of everything. Holy Spirit is totally different, right? We need to read the Word of God in context, not with a theological bow tied on top of it. That's what we do sometimes. Yeah, we have the completed Word of God. But by the same token, we are going to be faced with challenges in our lives, aren't we? You can't always open up the Word of God and find a prescription that's going to fall, solve your problem. We're going to have challenges in our lives all the time that are going to require guidance of the Holy Spirit to get us through whatever is happening. That's what's there. See, the time to get to know the Holy Spirit is before war breaks out. Before everything starts tumbling, tumbling down. What do I mean? In the military, what do these people in the military do? They drill all the time, right? And they clean their guns. They learn how to shoot guns. They learn how to learn maps, read maps. They know how to do tactics and strategies, all these things. Why? So that if a war comes, they'll know what... You don't want to figure it out during a war, right? They need to be intimately... I need to have an intimate understanding of what it is, what warfare is, and what they're going to do. And so it is with us. We need to be in contact with God, be intimate with him. So when the war breaks out, well, what do I do? What am I do? And just fall into sorrow, grief, a pity party? You don't want to be there. I've had a pity party before. You don't want to have them. You just don't. And I want to think this out. Just a few hours earlier, okay? Remember, this is all happening that night. It's like a 12-hour period of that night. A few hours earlier in the upper room, uh, Jesus told them something, because now they're walking to the Garden of Gethsemane. But in, in, in John 14, Jesus said, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Gotcha. I'm with you, Jesus. We can do that, right? And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. So there's a transition. This, Jesus is leaving, but he's going to send a helper that's going to stay forever. Catch that? That's right there. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Interesting future event, right? Pentecost, what's going to happen? Holy Spirit's going to come reside in these disciples and in believers in a way the Holy Spirit has never done before. Ergo, you become a temple of the Holy Spirit when you come to Christ. And this Jesus is praying the Father would send the helper, right? Catch this little subtlety. Jesus is praying in, in 14. Jesus says he's going to pray the Father will, will send the helper. But back in verse 7 of our text, Jesus said he will send the helper. Did you catch that? Is it a contradiction? No, it's a confirmation of who Jesus is. It's a confirmation of who Jesus is because he says he and the Father are one, right? It's so important for us to see these subtleties that are in there. Things that get revealed. Little words sometimes have great meanings in the word of God. We need to be intimate with it. It is so, it, it is so uh, enlightening to us. And he says another helper here in, in John 14. Another. Another means uh, the idea, uh, uh, another means uh, uh, another helper. A helper is a comforter. Someone who helps, right? In this case, an advisor. A legal defender. Either, in a, either, in a, in a, either be a prosecutor or an advocate. It can be both. The Greek word from hel hel helper comes to the Greek word uh, paraclete. You can pronounce different ways. But it means to come alongside. That's what it means to come alongside. To come alongside someone to support them bring them to safety when they need it. To come alongside someone. And we should do that. You do that. Do you ever come alongside someone? You know, someday I'm going to be really old, okay? I won't be the pastor anymore. We'll get someone else in here. That's okay. But I won't be able to go in so well. And, and, and I hope you're going to say, hey, Pete, can I help you with that? And I mean, you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> Baby, grab my arm. Bring me, because I don't want to go down. We come alongside someone to help them. We ask. His disciples will need the Spirit to come alongside them, to guide them, because their challenges are coming, right? You read the Gospels, and you get into the book of Acts. <sighs> Listen, I don't want to be an apostle like they were. Not at all. The filling of the Spirit, once again, is going to happen 50 days from then after the, uh, after the resurrection of Pentecost. But Jesus tells his disciples, nevertheless, 
Nevertheless, despite what you're thinking, your perspective, or your disappointment, it's to your advantage that I go away. Now, that's hard to understand, right? It's to your advantage to go away. You know, sometimes people have to leave their families to support them. So years ago, in the 1970s, my brother and my brother-in-law, they left America. They, they left America. They, were, they went to Saudi Arabia to work for Saudi Arabia to, to make a lot of money to build a house or whatever. They went there. They go to Saudi. Back in the 70s, it was a great place to go for Americans. Not so much right now, but it was then. But they went there, and they were building, doing, they were dry, uh, running a construction crews, putting roads in the desert and building the camps where, where cities were going to be built in the desert, whatever. Well, here's what they observed when they were there. They were running construction businesses, and they looked out. There was no Saudi Arabians working in any of the construction. They were all people from other countries. They remembered, by and large, the bulk of the people they saw were Filipino. They were. I didn't, I'm not, it's not because this family of Filipinos over here. That's what they told me back then in the 70s. They were Filipinos. What did these, what did these men do? They left their families. Their, of their country of like, what, 7,000 islands? I don't know how many islands. Talk about 1,000 island dressing, okay? They left their families there, right? And they went to this land to make money to support the family. We know why? Because it was advantageous for their family to have support and money to do this. And now, folks, that's just an example to begin to highlight what Jesus is speaking of, right? That's what he did. He's leaving something, so something, he's leaving, so something much more advantageous for the disciples and for the world with the Holy Spirit coming. And this last point is the Spirit's character, so important for us. And when he has come, this is the helper, this is the Spirit, this is the comforter, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. His statement here, the character of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm only going to touch on, uh, on one, one of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit, that is conviction. Now, I don't know about you, but doesn't conviction sound bad? It does to me. When people are convicted, they go to jail. I don't want to be convicted. I didn't do anything wrong, really. Yeah, you know, jail. Is the Holy Spirit putting people in jail? Is the Holy Spirit putting people in hell? It's quite the opposite. It is quite the opposite. We serve a saving God. That's who we serve. People that reject God separate themselves from him. You have to reject God because he's there for you. To convict is to reprove or bring something to light, shed, shed light on a subject. That's what we talk about conviction. Conviction sheds light on a, on, a, on a situation, okay? See, our concept of conviction today is bound in all the myriad of law enforcement cop shows that are on TV, right? That's not what it is, right? Go all the way back to the Hill Street Blues. That's why it was my mind where it started, the Hill Street Blues. Great cop show. All the way to NCIS and forward. I mean, there are more cop shows than we could ever imagine. Isn't it amazing? What is our fascinating, fascination with this? Because we're fascinated with the, with the law, with judgment, with justice. And of course, we don't want to be judged or have justice put us for our driving habits, but we should have won on everyone else. I just say that. I always say that because it's so true. It's so true. That's what happens. Holy Spirit is spreading light into these people's lives, okay? Holy Spirit is shedding light into the entire world, not just into believers. That's important for us to understand. The Holy Spirit will live inside of people that are born again. This is true. But before I was born again, I was convicted. I realized I was guilty. We all have a conscience, and conscience brings our sin to awareness. That's what it does. But the Holy Spirit is not your conscience. Everyone has a conscience, okay? My sin was exposed, so I became convicted. Jesus said in verse 9 about those, he says they were convicted, right? He says, of sin, because they did not believe me. I was the they there. Before I believed, 
That was me. That was you too. See, the Holy Spirit is shedding light onto us and onto our sin. Here's the problem. And I don't use the word problem that often, but here's the problem. Our problem is that sin doesn't always look evil to us. Does it? What is evil in God's eyes might even look good to us. What God sees as ugly, we might see as beautiful. Right? A man might be shopping with his wife, going someplace, and he sees a beautiful woman and lusts after her. A woman is doing her taxes, and she finds a great way to hide her taxes and cheat on her taxes and get away with it, and she's excited about it. Both cases, that's great. But it's not, is it? No, it's not. Every hair person has a conscience that will convict us of our sin. We can shut our conscience down real easy because God also gave us free will. Isn't that an amazing thing? God is so kind to us. Don't you wish sometimes he just made us robots? But he didn't. Don't you wish you just always do the right thing? But you don't. But you can't. Don't ever say you can't. You can. You can, you can, you can. Let the spirit in there. But our conscience is not the Holy Spirit. What's the purpose of an indictment? or a guilty finding it, 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 with God, it, 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 with God it, it is not to condemn a person. The Holy Spirit's not c condemning us in the way that, uh, that we think of condemnation. The Holy Spirit is convicting us to bring us to salvation. To salvation. The Holy Spirit, the way God is working, is opposite of our justice system in the world. The Holy Spirit convicts us of one particular sin. That is the sin of unbelief. That's what we need to deal with, folks. Unbelief. Unbelief is what condemns a lost sinner. That's it. John chapter 3, early on, verse 18 to 21. He who believes in me is not condemned. That's good. But he who does not believe in me is condemned already because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And we've already seen that earlier, believing in Jesus' name. And this is a condemnation. This is how it works. That the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are, deeds are evil. And isn't that what we do sometimes? Light has come into the world, but we can love darkness more than that. Why? Because our deeds are evil. And at times we think that evil is beautiful. Just be honest, okay? Be honest. It, 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 it hurts. Everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. I don't want to go near that light. Do you ever wonder why sometimes the pews aren't full? Do you think people want to hear this message? You, you do probably, right? It might even hurt a little bit, but aren't you glad you're hearing what this is? I am. I was glad to read this text and, and, and go through and do this. But if you don't want to be exposed, the last place you're going to do is come through these doors. This wicked Christian church. Why are you going to come in here? So you can hear about, you're going to have to actually, I, I, my goal is to have us face what the Spirit's saying. People, don't, they want to hide from this. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds should become clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Folks, one thing you need to remember, we do what we want to do. That's the thing we want to do, right? That's that. I remember we sang this song a couple of weeks ago, and I liked it. There's one line from it, and I think I mentioned it last week. Let the things that break our heart be the things that break God's heart. Let the things that break our heart be the things that break God's heart, right? Because I've got all sorts of things that break my heart. What breaks God's heart? Do we contemplate on this? Are we intimate enough with God to see where, you know, we, we, we want to know sometimes what we're supposed to do? Are we thinking what breaks God's heart? It might open up a door real quick, real easily. When we think of that. I just love that one line, that, 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 that song. The spirit today is the light that has come into the world. The spirit lives in born-again believers. What fills you controls you. But until the spirit comes into your life, condemnation fills a person. It's hard, isn't it? It really is. It's my way or his way. There's no... I don't know how else to put it, you know? There's a fork in the road. Okay? That's the way it is. Which way will I go? 
Which way will you go? Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's pretty explicit, isn't it? It's pretty easy in many respects. It just is. I mean, it's hard, but it's easy, and it's beautiful, and it's great liberty in that. See, when the, fear, when the Spirit fills a person, the Spirit controls. You and I need to want to go where Jesus went, okay? But it's only if the Spirit fills you and I, all right? And that's what God does, right? There will be a true desire to be joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Is that a true desire in my life? Or is that something else that's nebulous out there? Oh, yeah, joint heir with Jesus. Whatever. Nah. The disciples had to learn this, folks. Even with the entire written of word of God, we need to as well. Today, we're all going to go out go our own way after this. What will we do? We're all going to do something, right? What's going to fill us? Is it the Spirit of God is going to be in whatever we're going to do? That's what I would challenge you with today. Is the Spirit of God going to be in what we're going to do? It doesn't mean that you're going to go around giving out flowers to people or anything, but is the Spirit of God going to be guiding us? You can still watch a football game. I don't care. But is the Spirit of God in any of these things? We need to be able to think this thing through. The Spirit has come. It's shedding light into people's lives. God doesn't send anyone to hell. He's trying to show us our sin and know that there's a Savior. There's a Savior there that's paid the price for that sin. Let's pray.